decolonizing movement, emerging paradigms, and reconstruction. Hi, my name is Michael Gray Eyes, and this video is titled Decolonizing Movement, Emerging Paradigms, and Reconstruction. I teach and create at York University, where I'm the graduate program director of the MFA and the artistic director of Signal Theatre. We have been trained with right and wrong as the parameters for doing. If we can, for just a moment, disentangle ourselves from the connotations that envelop these words, what would we see? We'd see a basic structure echoing many other simplistic binaries, heaven and hell, east and west, rich and poor, black and white, good and evil. In this case, these binaries are Western in their origin and threaded through nearly everything we do and how we see ourselves. But in order to actually experience all the facets of creativity, we need to come up with something else. We need another structure or foundation upon which we might base our judgment. We require a new paradigm for doing. And for this, we'll need to travel west across this continent and back in time to the late 90s. In 1997, I was living and working in Los Angeles, California as an actor. While working on a television show, I had the good fortune to work with an indigenous stuntman named Richard Alaniz. Richard was an experienced martial artist who was part of Dan Inosanto's first graduating class. Dan Inosanto, for those of you not raised reading Black Belt magazine in the 1970s or 80s, was Bruce Lee's protege who assisted Lee in the development of Jeet Kune Do, a new martial art created by Bruce Lee to address how static forms, such as Kung Fu, could be revitalized through change and innovation. Richard talked to me about a lot of stuff, but what I remember most is his statement that each and every culture had its own martial art. For example, in Japan, karate, judo, and jujitsu emerged, while in China, other forms like Kung Fu or Tai Chi rose to the fore. In Malaysia, Silat, Thailand, Muay Thai, in Europe, boxing, etc. Alanese asserted, of course, that we, the indigenous people of North America, had our own systems, but that today these martial arts were mostly lost, remaining only in vague descriptions like Indian wrestling. I was fascinated by this idea. Richard's training at the Inosanto Academy was eclectic. Inosanto himself, Richard explained, traveled the globe to study martial arts where each form had developed. Returning to the U.S., he expanded the ideas of Jeet Kune Do to create an even more comprehensive system. This hybridization and cross-pollinating of ideas and techniques literally birthed the MMA, or mixed martial arts, movement. This eclecticism in martial arts is not unique. The Brazilians took jiu-jitsu from Japanese immigrants and adapted it into a style that has captured world attention. Russians did the same, calling their form sambo, and on and on. Richard went on to describe how this breadth of training led him toward an investigation of indigenous forms and ultimately a recuperation of the form itself. Alanese articulated how takedowns like leg sweeps and shooting must be incorporated. Grappling techniques, once the opponent is taken to the ground, must also be accounted for, as well as strikes and defenses against the types of weapons we traditionally used, knives, axes, clubs, spears. He imagined that the environment would naturally write upon the form, so that each community, each region would respond with techniques appropriate to their own terrain. Long before I began an examination of the colonial foundation of my own physical training, I witnessed another artist articulate a methodology for recuperating our cultural past. This leads me, interestingly, to movement training within the academy and in theater conservatory settings throughout North America. August Schellenberg, one of Canada's greatest actors, was Mohawk. He met me on a film project in the American Southwest, and we hit it off immediately despite our difference in age and experience. He appreciated that I came from a rigorous training background. In my case, the National Ballet School in Toronto, while he had attended Canada's prestigious National Theatre School. We both studied classical ballet 
which was, and still is, a lingua franca in the Western training canon. Ballet is a vastly complicated and difficult movement form to master. In typical circumstances, a student might take around 10 years to master the form. And if not master, then at least be able to demonstrate proficiency at the professional level. There are other physical training modes that can accomplish what ballet does, which improves coordination, strength, increases flexibility and musicality. But what makes it particularly useful is that it is a Eurocentric platform that emerges from the court dances of Europe and aesthetic notions tied into the Western theatrical canon. In other words, if you can do ballet, you'll find it easier to formalize your body to fit into the classical works of Shakespeare and other Elizabethans, and especially subsequent theatrical genres, such as restoration drama. As I said in a keynote speech I once gave on the matter, classical ballet can help a 21st century kid from Scarborough or Timmins stand around the streets of Fair Verona like they belong there. But here's the catch. I don't want to stand around on the streets of Fair Verona, unless, of course, you fly me over there for a holiday. I like Romeo and Juliet, don't get me wrong. I just don't want to dedicate my career to performing in it or works like it. I want to do plays for my community. I like playing Indians. It's why I perform and make theater in the first place. But there's a more pernicious reason to avoid such training. It's called neuromuscular patterning. It's how our bodies learn to do anything. We create pathways in our minds by performing physical actions. The doing and thinking become one intertwined thing. When I, as an adult, tried to learn grass dancing, one of our traditional dance forms, it was hugely problematic. Even though I had grown up watching it, hearing the songs, my body was programmed to do something else. Sadly, I might as well have been Louis XIV out there in the power circle when I first began. Indeed, make sure you watch Nyla and Nina's videos in the series to look at how bodies and practices can be colonized by other cultures and the ways we can move beyond that colonization. By challenging the associations and supposedly neutral foundation of ballet as a training form for the 21st century, I seek to illuminate the fact that actors in this country are a colonial product with Western aesthetics and even ways of moving embedded in their voices and bodies. But before we burn it at the stake, I am required to ask the following question. What does the form actually do? And if we abandon it, how can we replace the benefits of it? So, ballet proposes that the human body is essentially malleable, that the geometric forms and lines of classical ballet are shapes that a fluent practitioner must be able to re recreate. Okay, cool concept. What else? Ballet asserts that elongation along the spine frees the limbs to create myriad shapes and movements. Thus core strength is at the root of the practice. Great, what else? That the body can hold tremendous amounts of tension, for example, in the supporting leg and side, thus providing stability while allowing an equally free and relaxed musculature, i.e. the working leg and side, to remain mobile in the very same instant. As well, the very act of training in ballet requires many hours upon hours, year upon year of intense practice. This level of repetition reminds me of Malcolm Gladwell's provocation that those who seek excellence must spend 10,000 hours doing it. Ballet dancers, any kind of dancer for that matter, easily spend this amount of time in the studio in rehearsal as part of their training. Ballet also instills an unbelievable level of precision in the practice of it. Precision is good. I need it in my work as a theater maker, as a director, and I require actors capable of precision. But sadly, no conservatory training program in North America has 10,000 hours to give to an adult actor to train in this way. So I am responsible as I throw the form and other colonial practices onto the bonfire for coming up with other ways of making our performers malleable, strong, and capable of accurate and precise repetition, hour after hour, day after day. I am, however, buoyed by the fact that I don't have to invent an entirely new canon by myself. Indigenous cultural practices like singing, dancing, and storytelling are built upon rigorous and exacting practices. Excellence is built into our art forms. Excellence is not Western. 
it is a universal notion. So I imagine that with such pathways to excellence already mapped out by our traditional practices, I only have to add in other layers and systems to achieve similar ends. I follow the eclectic approach proposed by Dan Inosanto and Richard Alanis as I seek to craft a new actor training. I use the methodology of Japanese director Tadeshi Suzuki, whose form is a hybrid of kabuki and no dance and martial arts. Viewpoints, a non-hierarchical form developed by Mary Overly and subsequently re-articulated by Anne Bogart and Wendell Beavers. Gyrokinesis, a somatic alignment and movement practice derived from yoga, swimming, dance, and gymnastics, developed by Julio Horvath, and devising my own exercises that promote visual acuity, repetition, accuracy, and malleability. And this is only a starting point toward a new paradigm. But even as I introduce students to these forms and apply my sense of rigor to their work, they get frustrated with their progress and retreat from the work and respond by saying they're getting caught up in doing it right, shutting down when they're wrong. So I see a temptation to throw the baby doing something accurately or with rigor out with the bathwater colonial system. And if this is done, then we'll end up with lesser skilled performers, less capable. Even the ways of teaching are influenced by these old binaries. The words right and wrong are too fraught. We've been bludgeoned with them for a long time. So let's use different ones. Accurate, more accurate, precise, less precise, but hold our students and ourselves to the highest standards of achievement. Ones that our ancestors knew keenly and relied upon to survive.